Hey everyone, you're listening to the 107 podcast where we get together every fortnight and sometimes more often to talk about technology, business and the humans in it. I'm your host Ivan Stegic. My guest today is Adam Hale, who is partner and COO of Summit CPA Group with global headquarters in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Adam majored in accounting in college, but also minored in communications. So we're going to see if I'm able to get him out of his shell in today's episode. Adam, welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So do I get to talk now? Uh, the communication <laughs> piece, I, I just want to make sure. So yeah. one word answers. Yes, you, okay. yes, one word answers. That's the preferred mode of communication here. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So Summit CPA, you are partner and you are also COO. What the heck is Summit? Oh, man. Um, that, I, so that can go a couple different directions. So in, in, a, in a broader sense, I guess, uh, we are the defender of profits is Ooh. the way I kind of look at it. So um, we are a virtual CFO firm, um, and our purpose is really just helping businesses uh, clarify direction. You know, we... Uh, you know, our background, obviously in finance, we are a CPA firm. Um, and so we do a lot with forecasting and, uh, just helping clients figure out business. You know, a lot of times clients feel like they have a vision, they have goals, they have targets. We just kind of help make those a reality and and help them kind of look ahead through the financial lens. Why is it called summit? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, we actually started it in the Summit City, which is in Fort Wayne. It's a, a city built up on a, an actual summit. Um, but the reason being, uh, most CPA firms, like law firms, they have the name of the owner in them. So whenever uh, we very first started Summit CPA back in 2002, uh, my partner, actually I was an employee at the time, uh, rather than calling it Grundon Hale or just Grundon, that's his last name, by the way. It, it, Hi, Jody. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> rather than do that, like Jody was very visionary with a lot of what we do here at Summit, both in how we price and how we think about things. And, and one started with the way we named the company. Like Jody from the very get go was like, hey, I don't want it to be about me or be about you. I want it to be about our entire company. Um, and I want people that whenever they think about us, they don't know if there's two of us or a thousand of us. Um, so again, just straight from the, you know, from the very beginning of, uh, the creation of Summit CPA, that that's the kind of vision that we went with right out of the gate. So he just wanted to be bigger than us, I guess. And you just mentioned that you were originally an employee, but you're a partner, but you also talk about being there right at the beginning and founding it. So how, how did that work out? Cause I know you had one job before summit, right? Out of college. Yeah, actually it was with Jody. So we have a little, uh, I call it our Jerry Maguire moment. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie. Um, love that movie. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, so he completed me. Um, no, we, <laughs> uh, he was, uh, we're going to have to have Jody on the show and ask him if that's true. Yeah. Well, <laughs> luckily for him, like, you know, he gets to be Tom Cruise, uh, in this, uh, in this Aww. little story. I'm, I'm Renee. So um, right out of college, I interviewed with a couple different places. I really liked, I met with Jody and another person, really liked their personality, their style. Um, it wasn't super uptight. So I was um, pretty excited about that and uh, took the opportunity within like three months of working uh, there. Uh, Jody and kind of, he was the regional, it was a regional CPA firm and he was running that office. Um, for whatever reason, there was kind of a little bit of a falling out with, with, you know, how things are being run. Uh, Jody's like, Hey, they wanted me to let you go. They wanted me to do all this stuff. Of course, you know, I was a great team member, so it's not like they wanted to let me go. They just didn't really kind of believe in Jody's style. Um, you know, in the accounting world, Mm. it's, it's, well, it's just, it's just a dog. It's eat what you kill. Um, everybody puts in 80, 90 hours a week and the partners are supposed to lead by example. And Jody was all about leverage, building a business, you know, instead of being self-employed. So that's kind of the way it started. He left and, you know, whenever he left, uh, he, he just said, Hey, you want to come with me? And, um, I had some conversations with, uh, with the existing CPA firm owner, uh, didn't really like the way they went, uh, showed a lot of, um, of character on Jody's side. So I decided, um, yeah, I would follow him and his goldfish to uh, to the new place. So that's what we did. And, um, so I was employee number one probably for 
uh, it was probably about two or three years. Um, and then uh, by happenstance in like 2006, uh, there was an opportunity for me to to take on a bigger role and we were having more people. So that's what I did. Good for you. That's that's amazing. So now Jody and Adam are partners in Summit CPA, and your role is COO, so Chief Operating Officer. Uh, tell me, tell me what your day looks like. What are you mostly concerned with as the COO? COO is the one that's the integrator. That's the person that just makes shit happen. So, like Jody, he's very, um, you know, again, he's he's a very uh, vision driven type of a person. So he comes up with a lot of a great ideas, a lot of crazy ones, too. So it's really my role, my job to kind of listen and then just make sure that that gets, um, you know, translated to the team and that we can execute with it. So, you know, a typical day for me, you know, outside of the three hour, I work from home. So, you know, the first couple hours of my day is just getting kids ready for school, making sure they have their mm-hmm. stuff. Um, you know how that goes. And then, uh, yep. so I, I get a little pretty late start to the morning, but you know, in terms of the work, um, it's really just happiness. I know that especially like in, in the digital space, like director of happiness is kind of like a thing sometimes, but like for me, it's about making sure that the team and our clients are both in align with where our core values are and the direction of the company. So, and, and that exists in, in everything from how we execute on different things, what our deliverables are, you know, how we're communicating with our clients, how we communicate with team. So a, a day for me is typically just tons of meetings. So I'm meeting either with the internal team, just about what's going on with their clients and how I can help and support them. Um, and then also, you know, some client facing activities as well, where I'm just kind of, um, adding weight to a conversation, bringing in my experiences, doing those kind of things. You're kind of greasing the wheels, aren't you? That's the job, man. So that's what I try to do. (laughs) So, yep. Keep things moving. You guys are headquartered in Indiana, as you talked about, um, Fort Wayne. Um, were you always a distributed company? No. In fact, um, you know, we were probably brick and mortar for almost the first 10 years of operations. I mean, partly because we just didn't know any better and didn't know that there was an, an alternate, you know, solution. And, and in fairness, you know, technology wasn't the greatest back then. I mean, hell, yeah, I was using dial up internet, I think at my first, uh, my first job there, you know, so the internet connection was weak. People weren't used to doing video conferences, you know, so so technology has definitely definitely helped out. But you know, the way that kind of worked is uh, is funny. We uh, my partner had actually bought the building that we were in, and through um, through our growth, we actually um, we grew out of the building, and we had to do a bunch of construction. So we kicked everybody out of the office. And so Jody in his book, um, he talks a lot about. Um, he talks a lot about his, his fish tank because he was really proud that whenever he did the remodel and the rebuild, he put this really elaborate fish tank in there. He calls it his $100,000 fish tank because we spent $100,000 on the remodel. Um, and then what we found out is that whenever it was time to bring back everybody into the office, everybody's like, nah, I'm pretty good working at home now. So we got a lot of pushback about people working from home because they weren't nested. They didn't set up all their stuff and do all those kind of things. And so, um, but through this process, they had to stay at home for three or four months. So they had to make it work. And once they did, myself included, um, I was a, I was big pushback on, on going distributed. And whenever we, you know, went through that process, the majority of us ended up staying home. And the reason why that was a thing for us is we had a couple people on the team that had moved to different uh, locations and, uh, you know, they moved out of state and they we wanted to keep them on the team. So we were going to figure out a way to make it work. Um, It was a little disjointed at first. Um, It's hard. You know, distributed teams, culture is a big thing. And whenever you have a physical location, you end up with like this subculture. And um, the distributed folks on our team felt that. And so by by making this addition so that we could bring more people in office, we ended up actually doing the complete opposite. And then and then it wasn't, you know, soon after we kind of just fully embraced the, hey, let's just everybody work from home and let's just intentionally hire that way. And that's what we did. 
that sounds like a parallel universe story to the one that we had in becoming distributed. We were also in an office space that we owned and, and through happenstance decided to try being distributed and then no one came back. So, uh, it's, it was, <laughs> I thought works. that was a wonderful, yeah, it is. And I was also, um, against trying to be distributed at the outset as well. And now, now it's like the only way I think we should ever do business, but maybe that'll change again at some point. Uh, it's so I think being distributed is, um, more common in the industry you work in, in digital space in agencies such as my own, it seems to be not very common when it comes to a bunch of accountants and a bunch of finance people. Am I wrong? Oh, no. Yeah. It, whenever we go to conferences, we are definitely an outcast in the room in terms of how when we always have been, you know, in terms of how we bill and do things. But whenever we speak to accounting firms and we talk about being distributed, they just kind of look at us like we're crazy. And uh, and we probably are a little bit, but um, but it works out super well for us. And then whenever we walk through kind of like the advantages and how we work together and the fact is, is everybody works from home anyway, you know, a day or two mm -hmm. a week. So it's not that big of a leap these days. Um, you know, security is obviously a big concern. So we kind of talk through what we do for that in order to make sure things lock down. And then once we talk for a little bit, um, the, the conversation actually turns. I mean, we've had um, it's just the bigger firms. They can't figure out how to change their ways. But all the smaller firms that we work with, they're like, you know what? I think that's uh, the direction we're going to go. So. Yeah, it's actually, it's changing. And that's what our mission statement is at Summit CPA is changing the way people think about accounting. So we want that to be the way our team thinks about how we work. We want that to be the way our colleagues think about accounting. And then our customers, we want our customers to expect the type of service that we deliver. Um, we want everybody to, to kind of push that into, you know, their, you know, whatever accounting firm they're working with, they should expect this kind of service. As far as I'm concerned, you're the premier uh, CPA for the digital agency industry. Like everyone I know who are our competitors and friends, they use Summit. Why, why focus on, the, on this particular industry? Well, uh, you know, the history of it was, um, you know, and, and I think we've talked about it before, but, you know, um, Lullabot actually ended up being our first client. And uh, I think mm. it, it hit uh, Jody's uh, spam filter. And I remember. Oh, did it really? Yeah, it was like, <laughs> it hit, yeah, it hit his, I remember him coming into my office. It was like close to the end of the day. Um, and he was just like, uh, hey, I got this email. Uh, this company's not from Fort Wayne, you know? So back then it was like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. You know, we've got a couple of folks that are outside of the area. And so he's like, hey, you know, you think we should just give them a call or and we we're like, yeah, yeah. You know, like, like everything else we do, we're like, yeah, let's give it a shot. And so we were talking to him for a while and we thought they were just pitching us on our, our website and how horrible it was at the time. Um, although we thought it was great. Um, but, uh, oddly enough, no, they were asking, you know, Hey, can you be our CFO? And then they kind of explained to us that they were distributed. And so we kind of went down that path of how that worked, you know, because we were telling them, like, you know, you're kind of far away. We can't come see you. And they were like, no, that's cool. Like, this is the way it would work. And so they really opened our eyes up to um, just a different way to do business. Um, and so it was great, um, great experience, great people. Um, so, you know, we were we were pretty fortunate in that regard. And then the other thing that happened was that, the industry itself is so collaborative and, and, and very open to working together, you know, just mm -hmm. in general, which is, by the way, not the way most industries work. <laughs> you know, if they find out you work with somebody else that knows somebody, it's kind of, um, it's kind of a scary thing for, for a lot of different industries, not so much, uh, you know, in the creative space, that's, that's not what we found. Um, and in fact, they, they, um, referred us to a couple of our other, um, you know, I'll call them anchor clients in, in the space. And, and then they referred a couple people. So through just referrals, um, we had this great, um, launch launch pad from, for just working with great people and great ideas and the, the way they operated and did everything. Um, and then on the financial side, it was a total cheat. That's because oh, because you run really? exactly like a CPA firm. So what Jody and I are super passionate about is like running our firm and growing it and doing all these things and the metrics. They're the exact same ones that you have. 
So it was very natural for us and something that we were able to speak about uh, very easily and be able to draw our own comparisons and bring things into it. And then as we created this network of other agencies, we were able to kind of talk about industry best practices and standards and what we've seen work. And then that's grown to where we work with like at least 70 digital agencies on a, on a weekly basis, um, helping them through, you know, forecasting and being that VCFO. So um, it's been great. That, that's one of the things I appreciate most about the workshops that you have is the ability to provide a metric that is based on actual data from actual agencies that are similar to the agency I run. Like that's, there's a lot of power to that. And I know that when we were in Bend, you said with great confidence, you know, the average rate that a digital agency you, uh, has right now based on the last year of data is $162 per hour, right? That's like, there's, there's a value to that. I don't think any of your competitors can say that. No. And, and just the vernacular and just understanding the culture. Um, because again, there's, there's different things that it, once you get to know a, uh, what I, what I really love about summit and, and what we do, and, and I think is different than most CPA firms is the level of involvement uh, that we have with our clients, like we join the leadership team. We don't want to just be the finance person in the room or the, the, you know, just be the, you know, the person that you come to whenever you have a question that's related to finance. Like we listen to what's going on in the company, how things are going. And then we just kind of work that back into the forecast. Um, so it's not always sometimes about like how the other person did it. It's like, this is what everybody, this is kind of the average. This is where it should be. And here's why, here's what we've seen work, not work. Um, and this is why it might be best fit for you based on everything that we know about you. So it's, it really is like, it's a lot of industry knowledge and experience, but then it can be kind of still tailored for the individual agency, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And um, when, when Lullabot first came to you, were you distributed at that time? No, that's why I say we were we were totally in the dark with the whole concept. Like it, oh. it was um, it was really eye opening. Everything they introduced us. Actually, that's how we got to know um, Carl from the bureau. Is that um, they ran a conference called Yonder, and we ended up going out to San Diego and uh, being a part of Yonder, which was a distributed company. So it, it, it wasn't really geared specifically toward agencies. We had like a kickball company there. We had all kinds of different businesses. And at the time, we were, um, because of Lullabot, we were going distributed. So we weren't quite all the way there, um, but we went to that conference to get best practices, ideas on how to you know, interact with the team and all those kind of things. And I happened to actually be sitting right next to Carl in the, uh, um, at the conference and we were just kind of having a good time joking and, and talking about finance and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and whenever we got back, I think, uh, I asked Jody to reach out to him or he reached out to Jody. I can't remember what it was. And, uh, Carl's like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm part of this group, this community. Uh, we, I mean, and the bureau is fantastic. I mean, anytime we've ever been, absolutely. I mean, every industry should have it. I mean, it's kind of like group think group therapy, <laughs> like <laughs> it's amazing. Um, it is amazing. I mean, and, and you've been to a couple, right? I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, so he just, you know, he wanted to bring in a couple, you know, he didn't want somebody to, to come in and, you know, just pitch the group or, or be this thing. He's like, Hey, I want somebody just to kind of come in and, and help us understand the finances because this topic comes up a lot in our conversations. And so that's what we did. We thought, Hey, this is a, a good opportunity to learn and grow and have some of our clients there and just kind of community, you know, contribute to the community. And, and that's what we did. So, um, and Jody go, Jody's an empty nester. So yeah, you'll, you'll always hear Jody at those things. He's at almost every single <laughs> one I do whenever my, you know, whatever I can, <laughs> you know, I've got four children, <laughs> young children. So, you know, I've got a, a lot to do there, but, um, but Jody's great. He, uh, he takes one for the team for us and, you know, everybody knows his Hawaiian shirts that became kind of his, oh, yeah. his theme. So he's our mascot. I'm kind of surprised he didn't have a picture of the Hawaiian shirt on the book he published. Oh, that's true. Well, that's <laughs> maybe in the next yeah, one. Huh? He is, yeah, he's working on a second book. So, yeah, you're right. Maybe that should be the cover, the Hawaiian shirt. I'll have to I'll have to let him know. <laughs> Got to write that down. 
So um, you mentioned the acronym VCFO, virtual CFO. For what it's worth, I love that term. I feel like I know exactly what it means. Like that's that's good description. Talk to me about what a VCFO does in your mind, and and what does um, like what does a company like mine get from a VCFO that we might get from like Are you my VCFO? Is Jody my VCFO? Like, how does that work? What is it? How does it work? Yeah, no, it's a great question because it means um, even though it sounds. Um, it, it should, by by just the the words alone, it should define itself. Um, what we found is that you know back in two thousand and six or so, whenever we kind of I don't want to say we coined the phrase or invented it, but I mean we were one of the very first to use it, and it was just because we were cheap. Like in terms of SEO, we couldn't use accountant or CPA or any of those things. So what it meant to us was really um, being the you know exactly what it says, being the the chief um, financial person in the room to be able to kind of explain, you know, what's going on with the business. Cause everything has tentacles into the finance side. Um, mm-hmm. but what we found over the years is like every CPA firm now has fractional or VCFO on their, um, on their website. And to them, a lot of times it means back office accounting, which we can do, you know, if you need help paying your bills, managing cash flow, like that's a part of our service, but that's not core to what we do, what we do. And, and then there's also those folks out there that are specialists. They come in, they, they do the a heavy level consulting for a lot of money up front, and then they leave you to kind of figure out the rest. That's not what we do either. So our virtual CFO service um, it's almost like staff hog. So it, am I your CFO? Not anymore. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of greasing the wheels, as you said, just kind of moving things along Jody's team mascot. So he's always on the road kind of doing those kind of things, but we've got a team of just great, great, um, people that have a wide variety of experience and we kind of bring them in house, kind of show them what we're looking at, how we do things. Um, so it's a pretty consistent feel from, from, uh, you know, from CFO to CFO in terms of client experience, but the things that we help with is jumping in, you know, first things first, making sure garbage in garbage out, making sure everything's clean set up so we can compare you to the industry, you know, figure that out. And then we go through and we do, um, heavy forecasting. So we're asking about goals and vision and all those things. And if, if you don't know, we can help you kind of craft those and figure them out, um, we're kind of like the, the GPS, you know, we, you tell us where you want to go. We help you, you know, figure out the best path to get there. But beyond that, we, we jump in, we jump in the seat next to you and we're your co-pilot. So as life happens, as, as you know, you have to go left instead of right. We help you kind of, you know, get back on track and move things around. Like that's our, that's our job. So we're helping people with, um, profit sharing plans, uh, M and a deals, um, financing, or, you know, for, for bank, uh, trying to make sure that we're getting the, the financing that we need. Uh, we're also helping with scaling up and down, unfortunately, you know, sometimes you have to mm. scale things back. Those are common things that we work with. Um, we also help out with uh, biz dev, you know, setting them in a path and a direction, giving them the tools that they need so they know what to sell and, and how to sell it in terms of pricing and things of that nature. So we're very involved in that process as well. Um, and then again, we can fill in the back office stuff. So if your COO is the one doing all of the bill pay and, and doing a lot of those tactical things on the on the finance side, we can take those over. So we manage cash flow and pay bills for probably about a third of our clients. Uh, in some instances, we'll do invoicing. Um, we do tax work um, for probably about eighty to eighty five percent of our client base. Um, so that's tax planning, projections, and prep. Um, so again, instead of like. Every single month we do kind of like a soft tax plan. And then around this time of year, we're dialing things in, making sure everything's where it's supposed to be. We're setting aside money for taxes, helping you kind of do that as you go. And then our tax team comes in and just works really closely with our CFO team to make sure that we're, you know, minimizing taxes while we're maximizing profits on the other side of the business. And you mentioned earlier when we started talking that the way that Jody likes to operate and the way that you operate is that you have a different kind of way of billing and thinking about pricing structure and so on. H- how is that different than, than the norm? What, what's, what, what does the structure look like with you? Yeah, our structure, everything's value-based and fixed fee. So there's no surprises in terms of billing. So it's, 
We charge a flat fee on a weekly basis. There's no contract um, length of service for a year, any of that kind of stuff. We just ask for 30 days notice and we'll help with any kind of transaction that you need. Uh, fortunately, that doesn't happen very often unless we're helping clients through an M&A deal where they're selling out. But um, if and when it does, there's there's no commitment on on uh, our client side. They just say the word. Um, so what's unique about that is, again, in our space and the accounting world, um, although they're starting to come around and they're starting to do some flat fee services, um, we do everything on a flat fee. And so usually it's hourly billing. And so what happens is everybody's your best friend at the beginning of the engagement. They ask a lot of great questions and you do a lot of cool stuff. And then they get the bill for the quarter hour here or there and I stop calling. Um, so that, <laughs> you know, that's natural. I would do the oh, same yeah. thing. <laughs> There's a reason why they say, well, don't call the attorney just yet. Um, you know, so <laughs> it's like, you you know, it, we didn't want to have that. We knew that the key to our success was access and communication uh, with our client. And it was more about the long-term relationship than it was picking up the quarter of an hour. And so we made a very deliberate effort right out of the gate. Um, you know, shortly thereafter, I mean, it took a few learning lumps. And, man, we really screwed up our pricing pretty bad at the beginning. Uh, we just were not charging much at all. I think we finally kind of got that dialed in, but yeah, it took a, it took a little while, but that's uh, I think that's a big differentiator as well. You, you know what to expect from us. I mean, we advocate budgeting and forecasting, so it makes sense that we would do the same for our service. Absolutely. It does. Uh, one of the things I took to heart from the workshop that you had in Bend was the fixed fee expected dollars that are going to be spent. And we started uh, migrating our clients from being time and materials that were on maintenance contract to fixed fee. And we also went ahead and removed our annual commitments as well. And boy, does that make a, uh, a difference. Man, is that conversation then easy when there is no annual negotiation and no annual you know, fee increase and you're not locked in makes a difference. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it lets your value kind of speak for itself. And that was really important to us, too. We didn't want, you know, if, if a client wasn't seeing the value then and we value Bill, then, um, you know, that it, we understand, you know, sometimes there's a difference of, of opinion there or, or maybe they need something else that you can't offer. That's fine. Yeah. So I hear you have a podcast coming out uh, with a great name. Is that true? Yeah, of course, <laughs> it's a great name. It's the Virtual CPA Success Show for Creative Agencies. So that actually, I don't have a start date just yet, but it should be launching sometime in September. So this month. Um, we're just getting out a couple episodes and working out the kinks and then we should be live, do a couple of those each month. That sounds amazing. So uh, visit the website to find out more. That's summitcpa.net. That's, that's where you'll find it. You've been at Summit for a long time. What were you doing BS before Summit? Well, you were at that agency, weren't you? Yeah. Or that uh, accounting firm. Yeah, that's why I say, I mean, it was pretty short lived prior to Summit. So I feel, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a blessing. I mean, a lot of my, my friends, you know, kind of went through and stomp, you know, kind of worked through all their um, big four f experiences and then to corporate and then back to public. And, you know, I was pretty fortunate to, to land where I did. Um, it gave me. Uh, an opportunity to to grow. I mean, that's the the nice thing about you know as many people on your podcast probably that are in kind of an ownership role understand is that um, there's a lot of flexibility there. There's a lot of um, you know it's scary at times, and sometimes you make the you know you go down the wrong the wrong path. But all those learning lumps along the way have have gotten us where we are today, and so I'm very proud of that and and uh, glad I was able to to kind of start out the way that I was. And before that, you were in college and graduated, as I said at the top of the podcast, with a major in accounting and a minor in communications. And I, I wanted to ask about that. You don't usually find people who are in accounting also in communications. So how, how did you end up going down that road? What? I'm pretty sure what? accountants are known to no. be like, yeah, I mean, they're usually the person at the party everybody wants to chill with. I'm, I'm pretty confident <laughs> of that. Uh, you are you are being bad. I don't like st stereotypes, and you are perpetuating that stereotype. But 
Maybe I am well, too. Tell me, tell I mean, me how that happened. We're popular around April. You know, everybody's got a question. <laughs> um, but that's uh, right. But no, the uh, it, it, actually, it was a huge push. So like, whenever I was going to to school, the big theme was accountants are dorks. Um, nobody wants to talk to them. They're boring and they're dry. Um, you know that kind of a thing. So actually, our professors were pushing communications. The CPA exam was pushing communications. So it was really? kind of yeah, it was kind of around everything was centered around communications. Oddly enough, over the last like five years or so, uh, maybe a little bit with big data. You know, so again, our job is is taking data and turning it into information that people can use. Um, so I think the push has went away from communications. And it's been driven more towards big data. So you'll see a lot of folks in accounting focusing on just information systems and trying to make sure that they can corral the big data. Now, unfortunately, they won't be able to talk to anybody about it because <laughs> they, they, they <laughs> forgot that part. So they can read the numbers, they can find it and smash it together. But um, but that's what dashboards are for, right? <laughs> so, right. right. Why talk to other why, humans? Why talk to people? It's real time why? now. Uh, just get it yourself. It's on your phone. <laughs> Text me. Right. Text me if you need anything. Um, yeah, no, that's... Uh, so, yeah, that was the route. I mean, it was just uh, one of those things. And I've always enjoyed just talking to people, and I never shut up. So it was uh, it was a pretty easy ask of me. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was good stuff. And what university did you go to? Indiana University is where I got my degree from. And did you grow up in that area? Is that kind of your yeah. home base? You've, you're an Indianan? Oh, yeah. Is that, is that the right word? Indianan? Uh, Hoosier, actually. A Hoosier. Hoosier. Okay. Hoosier. Hoosier. Yeah, so you're so, a Hoosier born and bred? Born and bred, I am. So, um, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I, I grew up, I went away for college and, you know, came back and I met my wife um, early on in college. And so her family was kind of from around here. And then just whenever things were kind of picking up and we thought we had the ability to just kind of go mobile, um, which I think is so cool about some of the folks on our team that do that. I mean, we have somebody on our team that uh, um, her and her husband are going to take like a, a three month. They're going to live every three months. They're going to live in a different city for like the next 12 wow. cities. So that's what, so no kids, huh? no kids. Exa- there you go. So that's where I'm going with this is that. So, but just whenever that happened, I mean, I've got four kiddos and love them to death. Um, grandparents are super important, uh, role in their life. And, and they have both sets still alive and well, uh, here in the area. Good. So we just try to do really cool vacations and, uh, you know, and then obviously, you know, work it in, you know, here's your tax tip of the day, work it into some cool, um, you know, conferences or <laughs> luckily the bureau always goes to some really neat places. You can kind of work some yeah. stuff in there. It's been great. Um, you know, it's, again, I wouldn't do it any different. It's, it's just nice to be around family and, and still have the ability to kind of go cool places. So. And how old are your kids, Adam? So I am an accountant, so I, this will probably come to a surprise, but they're 13, 11, 9, and 7. So every two years, <laughs> so, <laughs> and not between January and April 15th. So, ta-da. <laughs> so. so let's talk about the tax ramifications of having <laughs> children that are not between January and April and it's spaced equally for two years. I, is this, are you, I don't, I can't tell if you're joking or not. Is this like, <laughs> no, that was, tell me about that it. That was completely intentional. Like, so, oh my God. so okay. Tell uh, us, tell me, like, tell me why. Well, because in our, now it's different for me now, but whenever I was, you know, whenever I was grinding it out, I mean, tax January through April, you're working like 80 hours hours a week. So I would have no time for a birthday or, you know, if my wife was near labor, like that was going to be like an issue. So again, that's, uh, those kind of things are pretty important to me. You know, obviously I want to be there for my family. And so I just wanted to make sure they were nowhere near the dead zone January through okay. April. <laughs> so, okay. So Got that, it. that was the intent. And every two years, like, you get the benefit of an additional write-off on a regular <laughs> basis? Is, like, that's the uh, plan? I wish. Um, no, they, <laughs> trust me, the, they, they cost way more than you get a deduction and a credit for. So, uh, no, it was just, uh, you know, the idea originally was, like, let's get them out of diapers and then have the next one. And then it's like, eh, we're getting a little older. We might as well just, so we, we kept them a little closer together, knowing that we were going to have four. 
So you're going to have four. You had them every two years. So if my math is correct, that's about eight, maybe more years of diapers yes. in a row. Yeah. Well, the diapers were bad enough. I mean, think about how long my poor wife was pregnant, like just in terms oh, of like yeah. <laughs> over the course of that time frame, she was more pregnant than she wasn't. <laughs> so luckily, oh, that's true. <laughs> luckily, she enjoyed her pregnancy. But um, nevertheless, she definitely was uh, was the saint in the family for for taking that on. So, um, so well, yeah. shout out to your wife for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, last question: Do you have any uh, potential accountants in the family in your in your children? You know, it's yeah. No, I've got. Um, I actually, my oldest daughter, she's super creative, which is the complete opposite of me. I always talk about how innovative I am, meaning I can just take somebody else's cool <laughs> idea and make it better. Um, she's definitely more creative, and so I've been trying to like you know, push her towards more art stuff and design and that kind of thing. Um, I probably, I think that I have a little bit of hope maybe in my, my youngest daughter. She seems pretty like she kind of holds the rest of us accountable to different stuff. So she might be my little accountant. The rest of them are probably, probably too cool for me. So I don't know. (laughs) Well, I I wish you the, the greatest of luck with all of that. I've had a wonderful time speaking with you on the podcast here learned a lot and um appreciate you being on the show yeah no appreciate you having me and uh look forward to talking again soon hopefully indeed adam hale is partner and coo of summit cpa and he was my guest today you can find them online at summitcpa.net You've been listening to the 107 podcast. Find us online at 107.com slash podcast. And if you have a second, do send us a message. We love hearing from you. Our email address is podcast at 107.com. Until next time, this is Ivan Stegich. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.